Hello and welcome. My name is Dave Nager. I'm an associate professor of clinical radiology at the University of California, San Francisco. We're continuing in our modules produced by the Society of Thoracic Radiology for our curriculum for students and allied health professionals. This is one of the modules for the advanced imaging section where we look at CTs and MRIs of the chest. And this is our first talk dedicated to MRIs specifically so we're going to focus on how to pick or how someone picks what is the best MR and when we need MR for the chest. Now, like with CT, when we're trying to figure out which test might be appropriate, it's sometimes helpful to look for a guide. Appropriateness criteria are guidelines that help us pick the best test for certain scenarios. And there's a set of these guidelines produced by the American College of Radiology. The web link is down at the bottom there. And this helps us pick which test might be appropriate in certain circumstances. Now, these criteria, which were produced by the ACR, are based on evidence. However much evidence is available, we try to make sure the guidelines are backed by research studies. These guidelines got input from not only radiologists, but others who help treat patients with specific diseases. And there are hundreds of topics to help us pick the right test. And in fact, it's tailored to even specific variants. So it's type of version, so if they have this symptom, but that was chronic or that is acute. In the realm of cardiac imaging, two of the example topics you might find there is myocardial disease caused by diseases other than coronary arteries, okay, called non-ischemic myocardial disease. Or for example, if someone thinks that the patient has a funny rhythm called an arrhythmia, and it's caused by an abnormality of the muscle, that concern, there is a topic for it. And then you figure out which imaging is most important or the most appropriate. And in many cases for these cardiac diseases, MR is often the right choice. Now, when you go to appropriateness criteria, you will see a table with different options. Here's actually an example that I used when we talked about appropriateness criteria for chest CTs. Here is two options. One actually is no imaging at all. But the second option is a chest CT without contrast. Now, if you go to various topics, there might actually be many more options besides just two. After you have the options listed on the left, the next column is the rating. The next column are comments, of which there are none in this case. And then finally, a graphical representation of how much radiation the test has. So for MRI, there's none. Now the rating is on a scale of one to nine. High numbers means the test is appropriate for that scenario. Middle level numbers means it might be appropriate and low numbers means it's probably not a good choice. So when we're talking about MRI for the thoracic cavity, we're usually talking about it in the context of evaluating the heart. Sometimes we get it for other reasons too, and I'll talk about those at the end. But let's talk about some of the cardiac reasons to get an MRI, and we'll use some cases. Here's a young patient who has a murmur, a swishing sound, when you listen to their chest with a stethoscope. Now we have a radiograph here. We reviewed radiographs in earlier modules. In this case, part of the aorta, the big vessel leaving the heart that sends blood elsewhere in the body, looks a bit big. So we're thinking maybe there's something wrong with the heart and a cardiac MRI is appropriate here. Now cardiac MRI, CMR, has a lot of different, what they're called sequences, different types of pictures. Some of them even move. In this case, I'm just showing a single picture. And I will highlight here, this is a normal slice from a cardiac MRI. And notice the left ventricle, which is this circular part. We're looking at it in a specific view. So the heart that does the main part of the pumping looks like a circle. And you'll notice in this case, the wall thickness, which is this dark part here, is a normal thickness, okay? In this case, it's a little bit less than a centimeter. 
That is normal. Now this patient who had this swishing sound is actually the next slide. Here, we see that the thickness of the wall of the left ventricle, the main pump, is thicker than it was on the last picture, which was normal before. So this is a very thick myocardium. This is called hypertrophy of the left ventricle. It means the left ventricle is working too hard. The reason it's working hard is because the valve is abnormal. And this is a slice through the valve. Now, if we looked at all of the pictures before and after, and in fact, this one actually had a movie, so moving picture, we could see that instead of three leaflets, instead of three parts of the valve, it has two. That's called a bicuspid aortic valve, and it makes it harder for blood to get through. So what does the MRI do for us for this patient? We can see that the valve was abnormal. We can actually attach a number that says how hard is it for blood to get through that abnormal valve. We can also actually see if blood goes backwards and how much blood is going backwards in between heartbeats. All right, let's look at another example case. Here, this is another young patient who's having trouble breathing. We see by the radiograph, there are big vessels leaving the heart going into the lungs. We see them here and we see them here. So again, we think there's something wrong with the heart and then the vessels leaving the heart. So this is a cardiac MRI, a CMR. And this is called a four chamber view because we can see one chamber here, one chamber here, one here, and one here four chambers, okay? And this one, which I'll highlight in red, is the main pumping chamber, the left ventricle. So this is normal. This is a view of this patient who has an abnormal heart. In this case, the right ventricle, which I'm highlighting now, is very large. That means something's going on that makes the part of the heart that pumps blood to the lungs be abnormal. It turns out what caused this was a hole in the heart, and we can actually see it here. This part should have a wall and does not. So blood is actually going over to the side of the heart that pumps blood to the lungs. It's getting too much blood and it's getting too large. And in fact, there's also a problem with blood going backwards through one of the valves. So what does the MRI do for us in this case? It helps us look for those holes in the heart where blood goes back and forth. We can also attach numbers to it to see how much blood is going backwards or going through these holes or how much is going backwards through valves. So when is a MRI of the heart useful? It's good for diseases of the heart muscle called cardiomyopathies. It's good to look for parts of the heart that have died from coronary artery disease called infarcts. It's good if the connections of the heart are abnormal. For example, if it was developed abnormal when the person was still developing in the uterus. It can look for holes in the heart called shunts. It helps us look for the aorta. And if you look at the vessels, we often call that an MR angiography, MRA. This is the best test to look for masses or tumors in the heart itself rather than a CT. And it's good for the lining around the heart called the pericardium. We can see when it's inflamed called pericarditis. And finally, this is one test we can use to look for part of the heart called the left atrium. You can also use a CT. Now, Sometimes we get the heart for, I'm sorry, we get an MR for indications besides just the heart. Okay, that's usually called a chest MRI. This is good for tumors or masses in the wall. Now we sometimes get a CT here too, but MR sometimes is useful. It's also particularly good for masses in the middle of the chest, um, in the mediastinum, including the part of the mediastinum called the thymus. 
So an example here, the thymus is this part in the front of the mediastinum. And here we have two different pictures of the same part. Do you see how on the one on the right that I'm highlighting now, inside this lenticular shape, it's darker? On this one sequence, if it's darker on the right and brighter on the left, that means this is normal thymus. It's not actually a mass. So it's a cool technique to know this is not something abnormal. And here, for example, we see a tumor. This one's very bright on this set of pictures. This is abnormal. And MRI is really good at telling us what this might be made out of based on if it is bright or dark on different types of pictures. So again, if you ever find yourself in a case where maybe an MRI needs to be ordered, or you're curious how other people decide if an MRI is appropriate, a good place to start is the appropriateness criteria. So again, this is one of the modules put together by the Society of Thoracic Radiology. Here's the website for the Society. We're very happy that you listened to this module and hope you've seen other ones as well. This is my name, David Naker, and my email address if you have any questions or comments. Thank you very much.